As we come to reflect on uh, particularly that second passage, let's pray. Dear Father, we do thank you for your word and we pray that by your spirit our hearts may be warmed and encouraged and uh, so glorify your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, I'm going to be talking about the ministry that we're doing, uh, but using this passage in 1 Thessalonians to reflect on that. Or alternatively, using our ministry in Taraja to uh, help us think about what this passage is saying to us. And uh, so I want to talk about how the gospel came to Taraja, uh, which then provides the context for our ministry there now. Well, 100 years ago, uh, Taraja was one of the last places that was actually conquered by the Dutch. Uh, so in 1908, they finally, uh, after two years of resistance, uh, they did finally uh, conquer the last uh, opposition. Uh, and then within 60 years of that time, uh, Taraja had become a majority Christian area. So that's quite a big change. So before then, it wasn't Muslim. Uh, it had its own animist religion, which we'll talk about a little bit. But uh, it, uh, so that was a help. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it uh, then, uh, the, the gospel had a big impact in terms of people's allegiance. Now, maybe two factors, very broadly speaking, that influenced that. Um, so the first was, um, the, uh, the Dutch victory. Now, we've got here a little picture of Taraja. It's fairly typical. Uh, this is a kind of valley where there's buildings, um, but you can see the mountainous terrain behind that. Interestingly enough, in 300 years before the Dutch conquered Taraja, uh, various Islamic kingdoms on the coast had tried to take over Taraja and Islamize it. That was one of the ways Islam spread in Indonesia. But they hadn't succeeded. Now, you look at that terrain, very mountainous terrain, and there's a big advantage to those who know the ins and outs of it. So they were able to defend themselves against um, Muslim uh, people trying to uh, conquer them and Islamize them. But then the Dutch came... And it will appear somehow that the Dutch god was stronger than the local gods. So this uh, Dutch came in the name of Jesus and uh, Jesus won. So that was one factor which uh, kind of gave credence to Christianity. And um, another factor kind of connected with that was as Indonesia became a, a nation after the Second World War, and Tarajan started going to other parts of Indonesia for economic opportunities, basically. Uh, the traditional Taraja religion just didn't make sense outside of the area. And so um, they, uh, more and more, Christianity seemed to, uh, to be an option for them. Okay, so you have on one side Jesus' superior power, apparently, uh, so, I mean, the, the Dutch administration were, I guess, religious, but not necessarily always particularly committed Christians, but they did bring with them uh, Dutch missionaries. Well, the first of those missionaries, actually, who was officially sent to that area, was martyred after a few years there. And that also had a deep impact. Not only that, uh, in the 50s and 60s, in the aftermath of the Second World War and uh, Declaration of Independence, there were elements in, in Sulawesi and other places who were unhappy that Indonesia hadn't become an Islamic state. Uh, and so there were army battalions that tried to instigate rebellions. And twice um, those rebels, kind of rebels, came through Taraja and uh, for parts of Taraja and tried to forcibly convert people. So for those who were still traditional animist religion, um, they might succeed, but a number of Christians were martyred. 
And again, that had a significant impact. So the Dutch missionary was martyred and then local uh, Taraja Christians were martyred. So you've got power on the one hand and suffering on the other hand. Now it's interesting, Paul mentions both those things. In verse 5, uh, our gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power. And then in verse 6, uh, talking about how you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering. Uh, so power and suffering. Although if we think about it, I'm not sure that by power, Paul means what the situation in Taraja. Because, of course, that is talking about the colonising power of the Dutch, superior military might. They were also, I think, good fighters, but, of, you know, the um, modern weapons and the like. Whereas Paul here is talking about um, power of the Holy Spirit, uh, may well include miracles. We know from the book of Acts that he did that, though it doesn't mention that in uh, Acts 17, which talks about uh, Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. Um, but it also includes the way that he spoke with a deep conviction that was echoed in the hearts of those in Thessalonica who responded to the gospel, thereby indicating that God had chosen them. Uh, that's how Paul describes it there. So I think the power aspect, we'd have to say, is different. The kind of power that Paul is talking about is a different kind of power to the political uh, power that um, the Dutch showed. Nevertheless, from the way that the Tarajans were thinking about things, we see this in the Old Testament as well. If, if a nation wins, that means their God has won. And so for the Tarajans, we're thinking in a similar kind of way. But if we're talking about suffering, yes. So, uh, if, especially in the early decades, if you became a Christian, then you were in some ways forsaking your families. And uh, you know, this is true in many parts of the world. Uh, so, particularly because you no longer were participating in uh, the rituals that kind of bound together communities and families. Um, and uh, so you were, in that sense... You are leaving the solidarity of the group. And, uh, I mean, this was an ongoing issue. Uh, the Dutch missionaries sought to discern which parts of the rituals were social, which parts were religious, and those kinds of things. But no question, if you became a Christian in those early years, you would face ostracism and opposition from your family who remained embedded in the traditional religion. But then, in beginning in the 50s and particularly in the 60s, for various reasons, there were mass conversions to Christianity. Everyone in the nation of Indonesia was meant to belong to one of the big religions, and so the Tarajans chose Christianity. And ever since then, it would be fair to say the church has kind of had a mixed loyalty. So they're kind of like the situation we in Israel, that re was reflected in our reading from Samuel, where, sure, they become Christians and so they pray to Jesus, but there's a whole lot of other powers around that they're interested in as well. So mixed loyalty uh, came to characterise a lot of the church. And uh, in particular, in Indonesia as a whole, to this day, religion is a major player socially, and so being religious, becoming a religious leader, which in Taraja means uh, Christianity, that's a means to social and political power. So that's the, the kind of broad context of uh, ministry there. And how is the gospel going now? Well, in verse 3, uh, Paul uh, thanks God for three fruits of the gospel. Uh, their work produced by faith, labour prompted by love, endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to talk about those three aspects in terms of understanding the situation um, of the church where we are from our particular perspective. So the work of faith here, uh, what I want to focus on, faith encompasses a lot obviously, but uh, Paul, in verse 9, uh, describes one of the central aspects of their faith, how they turned from idols to serve the living and true 
God. Now, in the first century, uh, in Thessalonica and other parts of the Roman Empire, people had idols everywhere. And idols kind of represented uh, the various powers from which you hope to get blessing. So you might have an idol, a family idol, in your home. Um, cities had idols representing the god who was the uh, kind of patron of the city. Different guilds, uh, different uh, professional associations would have an idol, a god that kind of represented their interests. And then, of course, there were gods for uh, uh, commerce and for love and so on and so forth. And so basically, where, wherever you were hoping for some kind of blessing and strength and help, um, there would be an idol representing some spiritual power along those lines. Now, if we think about the Tarajans, they didn't actually have uh, physical idols, uh, actual statues, apart from statues of ancestors. Uh, so there's just that one case, which weren't necessarily kind of didn't become the centre of um, ritual activities. But they did have various sorts of uh, spiritual powers that were accessed via rituals. And so the field spirits that were um, provided fertility, um, they were accessed in rituals where people would become possessed by the field spirits and thereby entertainment, entertain them. And so the field spirits would continue to provide uh, fertility uh, with the crops and the like. For family type affairs, you had your ancestors and the funeral ceremony was followed by another ceremony where they became divine, uh, they became stars in the sky and uh, they would uh, look down and, of course, they would be concerned for their descendants. So uh, for family type affairs, you had your ancestors. And then for various maybe less pro-social type things, you had magic to, you know, if you were hated someone and wanted them to get sick um, or, you know, a love potion or those kinds of things, you'd have various forms of magic with charms and uh, spells and, and the like. So they were the kinds of powers that uh, uh, traditional Tarajans would uh, access in order to live their lives. Now, in modern life, of course, the big idol... Uh, kind of as Jesus predicted, because I think you'd see the same thing in that very, uh, very cosmopolitan uh, Roman world, uh, the big idol is money, mammon. You can't serve God and mammon, says Jesus, singling out just the one idol. And uh, to this day, I think that's something that we share here in the West as well. But uh, money is increasingly, people are getting more and more well off, uh, more and more financially independent. And so some, that has a kind of corrosive effect on, uh, on how people live their lives. And uh, so many who aren't turning to the old gods um, are turning to the new god, money, uh, where money um, is uh, valued in itself and also for what you can buy that will then provide a display that will give you honour uh, in the community. Now, what Paul says showed the faith of the Thessalonicans was that they turned from these idols, whatever kind of idols they are, in whatever situation uh, we find ourselves, they turned from those idols to the living God, the God who is the one who actually provides life and blessing. And furthermore, that we know as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has experienced um, our human situation, like uh, the ancestors in the Tarajan understanding. And uh, in the Tarajan church, uh, there is genuine piety. By that I mean when people are sick or when they're looking uh, for their work, their daily activities uh, to succeed, they look to the God um, that they know in Jesus. So they'll ask for the prayer from the minister or from elders. Um, they'll go to church regularly. Uh, and they're looking um, to the God revealed in the gospel um, as their source of life and blessing. And 
it seems to me that uh, that is a key indicator of genuine faith because you do see many for whom Jesus is just one of several alternatives who are still basically polytheistic. And so, uh, you know, they might uh, be happy to be prayed for by the church, uh, but they're actually relying on their money um, or, um, uh, you know, or their various corrupt practices to get money. Um, or indeed they go to uh, traditional sources to uh, get the things that they need. Uh, and so those who uh, consistently turn to God uh, through the church and the church ministry uh, for blessing, uh, that is an actual work of faith. Um, that is a demonstration um, that they do believe in Jesus. Well, the second thing Paul talks about here is their labour of love. And it's interesting, uh, in chapter 2, uh, Paul goes on to talk about his love for the Thessalonicans, uh, how he had acted as a father towards them, as a mother towards them. He's not embarrassed to say he acted like a mother towards them. Uh, the point is he, he, he gave holistic care that children need. Then in chapter 4, he urges them to, he says, you're exercising brotherly love, but do so more and more. So clearly the love Paul is talking about here is very much a family love, the love of parents for children and uh, the love of uh, children for each other. And in Taraja, uh, the church community is very strong. The sense of the church as a family is, uh, uh, is still something which um, uh, continues to be a strength of the church. I think it's actually one of the challenges in Western culture uh, to have community and to build it and to maintain it because everything is wanting to push us uh, towards being in our own little silos and these days our own virtual silos. Uh, so we don't have to actually deal with anyone face to face. So the sense of community is strong, um, but uh, there is always uh, the problem. Oh, that, that was the martyr who was martyred. I've completely forgotten that I have slides here. Now, there we go. I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at that. Pay more attention to my notes. Here we have a uh, choir, and they're in a competition. Okay, now they're singing good songs, edifying Christian songs. They're songs that they, uh, and, you know, a number of them are actually quite good choir pieces, uh, quite complicated. Uh, they enjoy their choral tradition. They enjoy the songs. They enjoy singing them as spiritually encouraging songs. And the choirs, when they're going to a competition, they'll practice in the church service, and that will be edifying as well. But, of course, there's always this question in the back of uh, people's minds about motivation. Are they singing to praise God or to get the first prize? And, of course, you, you see it in the reactions when they don't get first prize. Some people get mad, the judges are unfair, blah, blah, blah. Um, whereas for other people, OK, oh, we didn't win, but we had, we had a great time uh, praising God uh, in that situation. Uh, and that's kind of illustrative of the general point. The sense of community is strong, but always with community, uh, that raises the question, is, is it just the community that people are after? Now, I want to suggest that the Western ways of looking at things actually confuses us at this point. So something I thought a lot about um, having been there and then in further studies that I did um, last decade. But uh, our strong kind of individualist focus, when I say our, maybe, maybe I'm, because many Asian people here would have, you'd have that as much more immediate part of your family tradition. But for the Anglos among us, individualism has been there for generations. Uh, and reciprocity is always considered with suspicion and honour shame is just associated with duelling and uh, those kinds of counterproductive things. But actually, uh, yeah, and, and, and that's because we're meant to be self-directed. We're meant to be individuals who 
uh, within ourselves, independently of other people, have come to understand the truth of the gospel, and so we obey God uh, from principle. But in relational cultures, reciprocity uh, is the meat of relationships. What does a relationship mean if you're not doing things for each other, if it's just one way? That's, that's, not a, that's not an ideal relationship. In some situations, fair enough, but uh, an ideal relationship is mutual. And then shame is about your sensitivity to other people and their needs and their feelings. So in a relational culture, these things are, uh, are what living well as a human is about. Now, it's interesting, as I thought about this, and I look at verse 6, what does Paul say there? Does he say, you took our ideas and you adopted them from your own, as your own? Is that what he says? No, he says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In their suffering, they saw what Paul was going through. They saw Paul's commitment to the gospel. They heard about what the Lord Jesus had gone through as he was tried and crucified. And they became, they, they caught not just the idea, but they saw the example and they imitated that. Now, of course, they're children in the faith. That's, what, that's how children learn, by imitation. The ideas are, you know, are how we begin to think about something that we're already experiencing. And Paul is saying, yes, obviously he's not saying the ideas aren't important. They preached a message about Jesus, lots of ideas in that which need to be believed. But, the, but what happened with the Thessalonians was that they caught by imitation the same passion that Paul had for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the issue that I see in the church is, uh, well, so the strength of the church then is that for many, they are looking for honour, validation and reciprocity within the church community. So in the church community, uh, which says that we should be loving each other, which says we should be worshipping God, not going after other sources and whatever, um, they're, they're, uh, ideally what they develop then is a sense of shame about doing those things which they understand through the church uh, and through seeing other godly examples are not the things to do that please the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is very much which community are you looking for for honour and shame? Now, Anglos are completely like that. The, the individualism of Western culture is a shimmerer. It's, it's, a, it's an ideology which doesn't bear much relation to psychological reality. Uh, all of us are actually imitating others. We've absorbed values and passions from other people. And then in turn, as Paul talks about here, uh, we become a model for other people. Now, the question is a model of what? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the challenge of the church is not that it's relational then, but that within the church culture, uh, the values are not sufficiently shaped by the gospel. And the particular weakness that I see is actually the third thing that Paul talks about. Uh, your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So in our next picture, here we have a traditional a place for Tarajans with traditional houses and rice barns. And here you see some water buffalo enjoying the good life, um, but it's basically their final meal. OK, I don't know how many days after this they were slaughtered, but I uh, decided not to show those pictures um, But uh, they, while they're still alive. Uh, so this funeral ceremony, which is a kind of wider family of Arby's, um, and they were going to be having a funeral ceremony which would last many days, and uh, there would be hundreds if not thousands of people who would come through. Uh, the animals are killed and cooked, uh, so they provide meat and uh, all that kind of thing. And in many ways, uh, certainly in the traditional understanding and for many uh, Tarajans now, 
their hope, their eschatology is about having a funeral ceremony that brings honour not so much to their personal name but to their family. Um, and so the fact that other people, the people that they've brought uh, their pigs or water buffaloes to bring them back, that there is an abundance, that many people come and pay their respects, all of those become uh, an indication of the good life that they have led as a Tarajan person. So that's their hope. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But what is lacking is that sense of the wider perspective that the gospel brings. Because this is about, in verse 10, waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. And are we waiting just in the church? Is Jesus just going to come back to Malabar? No, what we're waiting for is something that is worldwide. It's the ultimate political event where Jesus comes back and is revealed as the rightful Lord of this world. And so what that indicates is that the blessing we're looking for is not just for this life. So yes, they have faith for the blessing in this life. They're seeking to love each other and doing so in a middling kind of way like all of us. But that sense of hope is what is often uh, lacking. Their vision is quite limited. Now, of course, the fact that Jesus is coming again as a worldwide event is why you're supporting gospel work in completely unrelated part of the world. I mean, okay, Indonesia's closer than some parts of the world, but what happens in Taraja is of no interest to you in your everyday life. But because Jesus is Lord and we are waiting for him to be revealed as such, you support God's mission in other parts of the world. So the whole world becomes our concern because of the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, yeah, that's a hope with a sharp edge because it says Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. God as king over the world um, is going to exercise his anger against all impiety and injustice. And in Jesus uh, we are rescued from that. Uh, so that when he comes back it's a time of rejoicing. And so this is our motivation for mission. And in some ways this is the... The, the missing link in terms of, understand, in terms of uh, the culture of the church. So that, for example, going back to the choir, um, why, is winning, why is winning important? Well, that's a narrow perspective, isn't it? If you have a, if you have a much wider perspective, praising Jesus uh, is uh, much more important. Okay, so this is the context of the church, and what are we doing there? Well, in some ways, when I first went out in uh, 2001, 2000, uh, started in Taraja in 2002, there was actually the danger of liberal teaching uh, in the church. Um, but in about 10 or 15 years ago, um, that's changed significantly um, as they began to realise that the liberal teaching wasn't really bearing any fruit. And so there's, these days there's no shortage of like the confession of the church is good, uh, there's an emphasis on back to the Bible programs and those uh, kinds of things. Um, and so there's a sense in which we're not kind of doing pioneer evangelism uh, or even, uh, you know, standing alone as uh, Bible-believing Christians there. But uh, what we're seeking to do is to be providing examples so when Paul here talks about imitation and becoming a model, you can have good ideas, you can have correct beliefs, but if you don't see that fleshed out in people, it becomes very difficult for those to become fleshed out in ourselves. We are fundamentally relational, imitating beings. So for myself, um, so I'm teaching... I'm teaching at, uh, uh, at a college. I'm teaching master's level biblical studies. So uh, several of those are ministers. 
uh, in that photo. Others are just recent students. Uh, they're small classes because about 60 students doing master's courses, but not that many of them are interested in studying more deeply the Bible. Um, so that's sad, and I'm not even sure there's going to be any New Testament students this coming semester. We'll see. Uh, so, uh, but that's what I've been doing. Uh, uh, they're uh, biblical New Testament majors uh, for their master's course. And sure, lots of ideas, obviously, that we talk about in the lectures, but what they need to grasp and what... So for myself... I went through more college and I loved Greek and I loved Hebrew. Now, let me say that's not every more college student. Um, but uh, that was my passion. And the, the sense that by looking at the original languages that there's a kind of uh, an aid to thinking freshly about what God is saying. And I go to Taraja and realise how different the context is in many ways and the need there to think freshly about what God is saying to them. And so my passion is for students uh, to gain those kinds of skills so they're not just kind of rehashing uh, what the Dutch missionaries bought, which is fine stuff, but, but they need to be answering the questions that particularly arise out of their context. So that's the passion that I have. And in teaching, it's as that passion is caught to some extent by some of the students, and that's happened to varying degrees. So the language side is always weak. As I, I, ha I have a plan for that if you want to ask me about that at some stage. Um, but it's, it's that passion which I caught from my teachers of more college and uh, other ministry as well, and uh, seeking to provide there. And I also have a Bible, run a Bible study with elders of the church. Uh, we're at a simple, simpler level. Uh, the same thing is happening. And I'm refreshed by their enthusiasm uh, to learn the Bible. Now, here we have Arby with her primary school kids who are learning English. And uh, so Arby's English has come along um, in, ever since she met me, but she was interested in English before then. Uh, but the issue for Arby is not English so much as she was shaped by Prakantas, which is the Indonesian affiliate of IFES, International Fellowship of Evangelical Students. And so she experienced how the gospel can transform her life and she wants the kids to experience that as well. Now, Sunday school, they have in-school classrooms, literally, uh, in, particular, in our area of the church. And uh, it is like, um, and, and it's called Sunday school, and so it's like school. Now, is school about passion for learning? Uh, well, it should be, of course, but unfortunately it very often isn't. And Sunday school, is that about a passion for God or is it about learning to be compliant and uh, dutiful little children? Well, Arby wants them to experience her passion for Christ and for the transformation that that brings at their level as kids. So that's a question perhaps for all of us. We are imitating people. Who are we imitating? And, and thereby, what kind of example are we becoming to other people? in our families, in our work, in the social situations. Well, uh, let me again thank you for your partnership um, over particularly the past four years, but as I explained, going back over 20 years. And uh, let me reiterate, so if you're not receiving our prayer points, they come out monthly, they're usually not too long, uh, and uh, they give a, just an idea of what kind of things we've been doing. Um, so there's a 
sheet at the back that you can sign or you can use the QR code type stuff if you're more into that uh, or pick up a leaflet and uh, go on the internet, whichever ways. But uh, we invite you particularly to take that step if you haven't already because there's quite a number of you that have, let me say, which are very encouraging. Um, and uh, that enables you to get kind of more information than you'll just get through, say, the service prayer points and the like. Uh, and we're looking forward to engaging with you this coming week. So we're visiting hopefully all the groups really will get a chance. If, if your group didn't get a slot this week, we can arrange a time uh, later on. So we're not, we're not booked out for the rest of the year. Um, we, have, we have lots of spare spaces and uh, so we can engage with you at other times if needed. Uh, and we're looking forward to opportunities to share more um, and, uh, uh, and to be encouraged uh, in our fellowship together. So Paul, in this passage, gives thanks for the dramatic effect of the gospel on his hearers' lives. And uh, the same is true for us here. The same is true in Taraja. So may we all seek to follow and then become godly examples who serve the living God and are looking forward to the revealing of our true Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.